So many years of catastrophe, more than six million refugees, it could be you and your family, forced from your home and your history. We are the people, and this is our time. Stand up, sing out for Palestine. No matter your faith or community, this is a crime against humanity. Gods are turned into a prison camp, apartheid war divides the West Bank. We are the people and this is our time. Stand up, sing out for Palestine. Ah, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm your host, Catherine Wells, and welcome to Palestine Today, a radio program dedicated to the news, to news about Palestine. My co-host, British journalist and campaign filmmaker, Harry Fear, is in Gaza City, and we have a fabulous show, a fabulous show uh, prepared for you. Again, this week, Palestine Today brings you the unfiltered truth where you would get nowhere else in the mainstream media about the, pal- the situation in Palestine from the perspective of Palestinians who live there. Our weekly show is sponsored by the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs, Playgrounds for Palestine, and Mr. Henry Clifford. And I want to make a plea again, because our sponsors, although they're fantastic, they have only sponsored a limited amount of shows. So I'm making a plea again for donations. You can make donations at my website, thecathleenwellshow.com. Click on the Palestine Donate button. Uh, we need donations because, as I said, our sponsors, although we have them, they've only sponsored a limited amount of shows. And so we need, if you like the show, if you like the content, please consider making a donation. We really appreciate it. We have to pay for our airtime. KCAA is not owned by a big conglomerate, a mega corporation. It's independently owned, and so we have to pay for our airtime. Please make a donation so we can keep the show on the air. So, um, as I said, we have a great show prepared for you today. In fact, we have two guests. Uh, one is Palestinian filmmaker Hisham Zrak. I hope I pronounced his name correctly, and he will let me know if I didn't. And the other one is Noor. So, I want to mel- welcome you, Harry. Uh, good evening in Gaza, Harry. How are you? Oh, I can't hear you. Me, Kathleen. Oh, hi. How are you? I'm great. The last week since we had our last show has been so hectic. It feels like I haven't talked to you for about six months. Oh, my God. Six months? Uh, really. And one of the reasons for that is because what's been happening in Gaza has been also too much to cope with. So um, we'll hit over now and speak to our first guest, Noor Harazin, um, and hopefully bring her into the program. So that will take about 10 seconds, Kathleen. Okay. So we're going to get the latest news from Gaza from Noor Harazin. Uh, do do you want to touch base? Do you want to give us some insights since you're there in Gaza City? I know that Israel has been stru- making airstrikes on Gaza. Do you want to give us your your thoughts on that? Oh, maybe not. So anyway, he's going to be here in 10 seconds. As I said, uh, uh, Harry isn't with us now, but he'll be with us in 10 seconds. So we're waiting for him. We also have a great afternoon. We're going to be speaking with Hisham Zrak. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He's, he's a Palestinian filmmaker who will be talking with us after Noreen will give us the latest updates from Gaza. I know Israel has been uh, conducting airstrikes all week. In fact, I just read news that uh, uh, the U.S. confirmed. Are you on the line, Henry, Harry, yet? Uh, I am, but I'm just having a little bit of a technical dif- difficulty, actually. I'm, I'm just trying to fix that. Okay, that's okay. So, uh, I'll keep yeah. talking until you get it done, okay? Is that okay? Okay. okay. That sounds perfect. <laughs> okay. So what I was going to say is that I just, it was confirmed uh, yesterday, Washington, U.S. officials in Washington confirmed that uh, Israel had launched airstrikes into Syria. And they had struck, this is what is being reported, they had struck um, um, new chemical, uh, they had sh- struck chemical weapons that were being reportedly delivered to Hezbollah in Lebanon. That is what is being reported. I haven't seen the latest news regarding this since uh, last night, so I can't keep you up to date on that. But the question on the table is, are we going to... um, Are we going to get involved in a military excursion in Syria now that Israel has struck, has committed airstrikes into Syria? 
That's a question on the table. Let's hope not. We've seen this before, right? We've been here before. You, uh, President Obama, I remember he gave a speech recently. He said that uh, the U.S. will not, at least as this is where he's at at this point, the U.S. will not be engaged, will not engage military shoes or U.S. soldiers on the ground in Syria. I know that's for sure. We're still having some tech, technical dif- difficulties in getting Noreen on the line. Um, Actually, uh, uh, Kathleen, we are here if you can hear us. Yeah, I can hear you. And Noor is also joining us. Noor, can you hear us? Hello, yes, I can hear you. Oh, beautiful. Great. Uh, so, Noor Harazin, could you just in- uh, introduce yourself to our viewers and listeners uh, in California and around the world? Um, hello, and thanks for having me today. My name is Noor Harazin. Um, I'm a Palestinian girl from Gaza, and I'm working as an English reporter for Al Ifijah English Channel. Uh, is it right that you're the youngest uh, female reporter in Palestine for uh, English TV? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. But I started uh, at age of t- 21, uh, like almost two years ago. Uh, now I'm uh, 23. I guess maybe there's other 23-year-old reporters currently you now. Now, Kathleen, Noor and I have collaborated together on various film projects over the last year, so um, I know uh, Noor's work, um, and it's inspirational. Uh, if no one has seen Noor's work, she's too modest to plug her own websites and etc. but people can see her Facebook page, Update from Gaza, and also on YouTube, forward slash Update from Gaza. So, Noor, could you just tell us a little bit about what's happened in Gaza over the last week? Um, there have been several Israeli attacks uh, on, on the Gaza Strip last week. It started on Sunday morning uh, when the Israeli warplanes attacked uh, sites and farms in uh, northern Gaza. And also um, last Tuesday, uh, they attacked a motorcycle, killing um, a Palestinian man. He's 25 years old. His name is Haytham al Uh He's uh, from a uh, beach refugee camp. Uh, and um, this is like the main news that I guess maybe was reported in, in the Western media, but was what was not reported in the Western media is uh, the Israeli violations of, of the continuous Israeli violations of the truth uh, before these uh, airstrikes, uh, in between and after it. Uh, only the, uh, the last uh, week, uh, several um, Israeli attacks on these Palestinian fishermen inside the three miles limit. Of the Gazan Shore have been reported, which is also uh, not only violation by the attacks, but also it's violation for the truce agreement because they agreed to give the fishermen six miles limit in uh, in, uh, in the uh, Gazan uh, uh, sorry of the Gazan Shore. Uh, also, um, continuous shooting on the Palestinian fishermen around the borders. Uh, also, last week, last uh, Monday. Uh, the uh, Israeli uh, occupation forces shoot uh, Palestinian kids that were playing uh, eastern Gaza and Jabalia, uh, eastern northern Gaza, Jabalia camp, uh, injuring one uh, in his leg. Uh, and they also shot Palestinian home in eastern Gaza city. Um, uh, this is uh, the news that I think it was not reported in the Western media because, um, as we know, like all the Israeli attacks that ha- have been reported, uh, we can clearly read in the Western media that it came after uh, several uh, Gazan rockets that hit uh, the uh, settlement. But uh, we rarely, rarely hear about the continuous Israeli violations. Kathleen, did you hear about, for example, the shooting of the child in the lag in the USA? Uh, no, we don't, we don't get that kind of information at all in our mainstream media. We're completely, uh, you know, devoid of information here. We only get one side, and I think it's propaganda because it's not the truth. So, you know, our media is definitely pro-Israel, no doubt about it. No, uh, why exactly uh, does Israel continue these kinds of drip, drip violations, you know, shooting at children, harassing uh, fishermen and farmers? Why does that go on? I mean, surely that's not in the interest of Israel, is it? Um, I think that uh, this uh, this 
kinds of violations for us Palestinians and Gaza became something like normal, you know, because it's like daily attacks. It happens like 150 times since the truce came into effect five, five months ago. Um, I think it's like a kind, kind of a message that we can do whatever we want, uh, and you can barely like respond or defend yourself because we will be reporting that as a violation of the truth from the Palestinian side. Uh, just like the attacking of Haitham Mishal, the 25-year-old Palestinian man uh, last week, the uh, Israeli news agency claimed that he was responsible of attacking um, the uh, town of uh, of Elat, uh, northern Israel, occupied Palestine, but uh, we did not uh, hear any like um, statement from any resistance group from Gaza that they are responsible for these rockets. And this is like kind of of, of like um, confusing because whenever any uh, rocket is being launched from Gaza, it came after an Israeli attack, and it's being like a, a resistance group um, say that we are responsible for this. In the past two weeks, uh, most of the Israel, uh, most of uh, the um, rockets attack that was reported by the Israeli media has n no one of the resistance groups said that we did really fire these rockets. I mean, um, for, for the average Palestinian in Gaza today, what what is the main thing which makes their life difficult? Sorry, Harry, again? Yeah, well, what is the, the main thing that makes uh, life difficult for Palestinians in Gaza today, for, for most Palestinians? Um, I, I could say the, the siege, I mean, the Israeli siege on, on, on Gaza. Um, the, the Israeli siege was imposed in Gaza after Hamas uh, uh, took over the Gaza Strip, and uh, also particularly after... Um, uh, kidnapping Gilad Shalit, the uh, Israeli prisoner, but now he's released and uh, nothing happened, like Israel did not uh, lift its uh, illegal siege on the Gaza Strip, and people until today are still suffering from this, because basically, Karim Shalom goods border, it's like the basic um, border for Palestinians to get like the basic needs, like milk, yogurt, and other stuff, and the Israeli occupation forces have been closing this border for uh, like uh, weeks and many days in the last month um, and it's it, like nowadays it's hard for Palestinians to reach such basic stuff. No, thank you. We're going to go for a break now. Okay, I thank you very much. In fact, can I, before we go to a break, let me just ask you one question. Honor, do you mind if I ask you a question before we go to yes, break? Yes, yes. Okay, what I, you know, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, uh, Israel has uh, committed airstrikes into Syria. So they've got all this stuff going on, striking in Gaza, striking in Syria. What is the feel, what is the sense that you get from Palestinians as to the motives, the intentions uh, of Israel? What are what is what does Israel want? What are they doing now? Uh, I tell you something, Catherine. It's like it's like um, hard for us Palestinians to to uh, like uh, respond or to 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 attack because any like rocket that is fired from Gaza is being reported in the media as as we like showed Israel or showed the Israeli settlement and caused many damage. Palestinians are angry. Palestinians are angry of the continuous Israeli attacks on, on Gaza, in West Bank, in, on Syria, on like uh, flying over Lebanon. Palestinians and Arabs are, are clearly angry, but what, what can we do? Because uh, we can clearly see that the international community and the human rights organizations and all of this cannot affect the state of Israel. They, they can do just whatever they want with no one asking them, what are you doing, why is this, why is that? And this is like the fact, this is the hard fact for us to, 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 to accept and believe. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us here at Palestine today, Nora. I can feel the frustration, and it's understandable, and I hope American audiences, uh, listeners to KCAA can understand that frustration that you're experiencing and all Palestinians are feeling. I hope they feel the same way. So we're going to take a break, and when we come back from the break, we're going to be joined by Palestinian filmmaker Hisham Zrak. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but he'll let me know if I'm not, so we'll be right back. 
right back after the break. More than six million refugees, it could be you and your family. Thoughts from your own man, your history. We are the people and this is our time. Can you smell the aroma of sweet, delicious fruit and flaky, melt-in-your-mouth crust? What is that? It's Cobbler Mania. Cobbler Mania is a specialty dessert company founded several years ago that sells delicious fruit cobblers that are baked daily and sweetened with diabetic-friendly agave. Agave, you ask? Yes. It's like sugar, but not sugar, and better than sugar. Cobbler Mania cobblers are sold at the Torrance, Hollywood, Culver City, San Dimas, Marina Del Rey Farmer's Market. Also, apple and peach are sold daily at the Golden Bird in Los Angeles. You know Golden Bird that sells the fried chicken? At 83rd and Western, daily apple and peach cobblers. And yes, guess what? They're coming to the Pomona Fairplex Truck Fest. In fact, they're there right now, Thursdays from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. at Gate 1. Some of the favorites, peach, apple, mango, blueberry, peach, blackberry, blackberry, apple, white, peach. If you go to the Pomona Truck Fest Gate 1 on Thursdays from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. and mention me, Kathleen, you'll get something special. You don't want to miss it. I've had them. They're delicious. Playgrounds for Palestine is a non-for-profit 501c3 organization dedicated to upholding the Palestinian child's rights to play. This is a right enshrined in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of a Child. We operate through a volunteer board and staff. The generosity of our supporters and a lot of heart. To date, Playgrounds for Palestine has constructed 15 playgrounds in Palestine, as well as refugee camps in Lebanon and Syria. To contribute to this most worldly cause, please go to our website at www.playgroundsforpalestine.com. Org, or send a check to Playgrounds for Palestine, P.O. Box 559, Yardley, Pennsylvania, 19067, at www.playgroundsforpalestine.org. Are you fascinated by the Middle East, but worried that U.S. foreign policy may lead yet to another war? Do you care about civil rights? For the past 30 years, the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs has brought its readers the real news, minus the corporate media spin. Read about Palestinians trying to survive the world's largest occupation. Learn how your hard-earned tax dollars fund that illegal occupation. Find out how much your members of Congress has received from pro-Israel PACs and much, much more. Visit the Washington Report's website, www.wrmea.org, or call 888-881-5861 to request a free sample copy. Better yet, subscribe. It's only $29 for nine issues. Mention Palestine today and get a bonus gift. Like to spend a few days in another world? Then write this down. Golden Bear Cottages, Big Bear Lake. Now, listen, this is not some corporate-owned operation. It's family-owned and operated by some real nice people. Unique? Oh, you bet. Golden Bear Cottages features 28 one-of-a-kind cabins on a five-acre historic site. Great for families, couples, and groups. And cabins are available with one to seven bedrooms. Golden Bear Cottages is just a stone throw from Big Bear Lake and super close to three great ski areas. Now, I could go on all day about Golden Bear Cottages in Big Bear, but to see everything, just go to goldenbear.net. Again, goldenbear.net. Golden Bear Cottages in Big Bear. Clean, comfortable, and affordable. Check them out. Goldenbear.net. Redlands Blueprint and Commercial Printing Company has been serving the greater Inland Empire for over 60 years. For all of your printing needs, from full-color printing to high-speed copying and everything in between, go to Redlands Blueprint and Commercial Printing Company. Their staff is committed to your total satisfaction. Great service isn't just lip service at Redlands Blueprint and Commercial Printing Company. It's the way they do business year after year. Having trouble finding drafting supplies? Redlands Blueprint and Commercial Printing Company still carries is a complete selection. Redlands Blueprint and Commercial Printing Company is rated high in customer satisfaction by Value Star, an independent rating company. 
For all of your personal or business printing, call Redlands Blueprint and Commercial Printing Company at 909-792-3478. That's 792-3478. Or visit them on New York Street in Redlands off the I-10 and the Crosstown Freeway. Real talk for real people. Right here in the Inland Empire. We are 1050 AM KCAA. So many years of catastrophe, more than six million refugees, it could be you and your family, forced from your home and your history. We are the people, and this is our time. Stand up, sing out for Palestine. Ah, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back to Palestine today. I'm Kathleen Wells. My co-host is Harry Fear, who's in Gaza. And we just had an interview with Noor, who was giving us the latest updates from Gaza with Israel, uh, uh, Israel conducting airstrikes into Gaza. We also know, and, and, and she was telling, expressing the disappointment, the frustrations that Palestinian feels because the information is not being properly reported. We're going to bring on my, my, our second guest now, Hisham Zrak. He is an award-winning Palestinian Christian independent filmmaker, visual artist, and graphic designer. He is the uh, maker of the film Sons. It's a documentary, Sons of Iliban, which is a documentary about the massacre and expulsion of a small Palestinian, Palestinian village in the Gilea. Did I say that right, Hisham? Uh, Galilee. Galilee. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm so tongue-tied today. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I'm just tongue-tied for some reason. I can't get it straight. I think maybe because I haven't eaten anything and I'm on coffee, but I'm delighted to have you as a guest. So tell us, what motivated you to do the film The Sons of Iliban? Tell us about that. First of all, thank you for having me in, uh, in your show. You're very welcome. <clears throat> um... Two years before I started filming uh, the film, I was visiting my cousin uh, together with my father uh, in Basel, uh, Switzerland. When he started to tell the story of uh, the village of Labun in for, uh, 1948, um, we, we had this story many, many, many times, but this time he cried. Um, he got emotional and he gr- cried. And his tears triggered uh, triggered me to do this uh, documentary. And so you write, uh, let me read a portion of it. It says, it all started on October 30th, 1948, when the Israeli army interned his village and massacred 14 young men. One of them was his brothers, and some of the others were his cousins. And the villagers were forced to leave their country to Lebanon. This was, the only be- this was only the beginning of what he went through, a beginning of a long nightmare. In this nightmare, my father witnessed the massacre of about 50 young men who were convinced who were convinced to surrender their weapons, and the, and the minute they did, they were murdered in cold blood in front of people, in front of people of two villages, their own, Ili, their own village and Iliban. A boy of his age was shot while speaking to him about games. The blood of a woman sitting next to him splashed on his face when the soldier shot her hand. So this is your father's story. This is your father's story, and it's called the Nakba. Am I correct in saying it's the Nakba? Yes, yes, the event uh, that happened between 1947 and 1948, um, uh, which ended by destroying uh, 531 uh, Palestinian villages, uh, is called the Nakba. And uh, that was the, uh, actually the establishment of the State of Israel and the starting of the uh, refugee problem, the Palestinian refugee problem. Uh, I have a question. So, yes, you said the whole problem started in 1878. The first colony, the, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, this was the first, I would say, um, sparkle. Like the first ignition of the fuse, sort of, you know, the first yeah. light, and then yeah. it just got increasingly worse, increasingly worse, and it's even 
continuing on today, isn't it? The ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people, because essentially that's what it amounts to. Would you agree with that characterization? Uh, can you repeat the question again, please? Do, do, you know, it started in 1877. The first little spark ignited yeah. uh, in 18. And so this has been a continuation of the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people. Would you agree with that continuation, that the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian p people have continued on this long? Yeah, uh, ne it never ended, actually. It never ended. There, there are still, till this day, um, uh, cleansing. Uh, for example, in the ne in the Negev in the south, there are uh, about 40 un uh, villages that the Israelis will not um, accept their existence, and uh, they try to destroy them. In one village they keep rebuilding, and then they go and destroy it again. So it never end it never stopped actually since for uh, 19 <coughs> 1947 this ethnic cleansing. So this ethnic cleansing has not stopped. And, you know, when the Palestinians entered into the Oslo Agreement, give it, how, did you, how did you feel about that? How did, do you feel that the Oslo Agreement was an equitable agreement which Palestinians should have entered into? Now or then? Then. Then I was very happy, and like everybody, that we started having peace. Um, the Jewish community started to accept the Palestinian community and uh, a kind of uh, dialogue started between the nations. Um, this is in the level of the people, not in the political level. Now we know that in the political level, <laughs> um, it, wasn't, it was nothing but a trick, actually. It was nothing but a trick. Explain how it was nothing but a trick. I mean, uh, uh, back before Oslo... Uh, the territories were uh, officially uh, occupied, and Israel had the responsibility for the people and for, for everything. Now they have the Palestinian Authority, which is actually a meaningless uh, uh, entity, and they don't have uh, any responsibility as an occupier, but they are still like, occupying, actually. Mm -hmm. Even in Gaza, actually... Gaza is occupied. It's closed from all sides. This is occupation. It's an open, uh, an open, open prison. Op so, um, actually, they gained a lot from the Oslo uh, agreements. They have no responsibility, mm -hmm. and uh, they are uh, keeping the status quo that they had before. Mm -hmm. So it was a trick. So, I mean, how can the Palestinians negotiate, uh, enter into peace with someone who doesn't present themselves as an honest, honest negotiator? They're de they don't come in good faith. Do you know what I mean? There's no good faith. No. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, it's even more complicated than that. I mean, uh, the, Palestinian per per the Palestinian Authority is not independent. Uh, so they cannot negotiate. They, if, even if the Israelis are willing to negotiate, the Palestinian Authority or even Hamas, they are not in a position to negotiate because they are a kind of slave. They have no freedom. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, if, if Mahmoud Abbas wants to leave the territories, he needs to uh, get the Israeli permission. So... How can he negotiate? He's under the mercy of the Israelis. He cannot negotiate. I, I, read, is, uh, um, I read recently that uh, Hamas has said that, in theory, negotiating with the occupying power, uh, negotiating with Israel, is out of the question because peace offerings should be made by the occupier. You know, you can't negotiate with the person that's occupying your home. Uh, is that something that you think is right? Sure. I mean, the word negotiation in general in this situation is a joke. I mean, what is there to negotiate? Uh, the Palestinians uh, lost more than 80% of their land. So this is a fact. What we call Gaza Strip and, and uh, um, the West Bank are less than 20% of the historical Palestine. 
And the Israelis want to negotiate to take even more from that. And they don't want to give a, uh, a, a, a state to the Palestinians. And they don't want to. I don't, don't, don't want to. So what, what, uh, what is there to negotiate about? I mean, um, it's not even negotiation. It's only to accept the Israeli uh, conditions. This is not negotiation. And... Uh, I have- Yes. Now, I was just going to say that I, I saw that in the last 48 hours, Google has uh, changed um, the home page title for users in Palestine from Palestinian territories to Palestine. So it now says Google Palestine if you use Google in Gaza, for example. And this is met with outrage by Israel as if even recognizing Palestine was some kind of threat to Israel's national security, which I found quite amusing. Yeah, yeah, I, I just saw it before before uh, starting the show, and I wanted I didn't know if, if I, I wanted to cry or to laugh because it's like the 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 state of the Palestinians in 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 the U, in the UN and I mean people I live in Germany yeah? when you talk to people they are mentioning Palestine as a country like it's a country fighting another country which is Israel I mean it's it's a joke I what I I don't think that Israeli are really um, angry about it they are just making fuss because it doesn't make it change really anything you you are in Gaza and you know how tiny this place is yeah I mean it's it seems uh, that Israel will complain about anything, even the smallest yeah. uh, word yeah, yeah. on the BBC News website. Yeah, yeah, for sure. This is propaganda. Mm-hmm. This and is it, propaganda. Yeah, and it's like a psych- psychological ploy, a game. A game. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and, and it gives a little bit of satisfaction to the Palestinians, uh, which is a, it's an illusion, actually. If, if Google puts Palestine or occupied territories or whatever, it doesn't change anything. Mm-hmm. People are being killed. People don't have their freedom. And uh, it will not bring anything. I would like to see a real peace, mm-hmm. not just uh, joking around. So how can real peace come? Do you think that the West, specifically the U.S., should be involved in bringing about real peace? Do you think the West has been a, a reasonable broker in this issue, an honest broker? No, no, no. The West is uh, more than pro-Israeli. As I said, I live here in Germany, and uh, the German media... Um, We'll never mention those airstrikes, for example, now. But if an, an Israeli is wounded, they will talk about it immediately. So how can they be a broker? They are just biased. They cannot be a broker. They cannot be a broker. So, I mean, it's it's almost, it's a very sad situation, I think. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, have... yeah, it's, Sorry. No, I'm sorry. I just feel like the whole situation is kind of sad. I know Harry is more optimistic than I am, you know, and I love his optimism, and I'm hopeful. Uh, I was a few weeks ago, Kathleen. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, If you are there, you cannot be optimistic. I mean, uh, um, I I, I used to live in Israel until uh, 2001, actually, yeah. Uh, in the break of the second intifada, I came to Germany. I got a job offer and I came to Germany. So I have Jewish friends. Even 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 my friends that know the Arabs from close, yeah, not only from the media. After an, uh, this intensive media uh, propaganda barrage. back then, yeah, barrage. Uh, just they changed the people's minds. Oh, people really? that were talking about peace yeah. voted for Sharon. Yeah. Sharon was considered a madman in Israel before the Second Intifada by about 80% of the population. But he won the election with a very high percentage. So, how can you be optimistic? 
Exactly. And, you know, let's go back to this uh, in 1948 when the your father's village was decimated and there was these massacres. That village. Um, also, tell us about the Der Yassin, where the Jewish terrorists under Menachem Begin, who became prime yeah. minister, massacred over 100 women, men and children. Talk to you. You know that issue? That uh, incident? OK. <clears throat> um, first of all, uh, Ailabun um, is a special case because Ailabun uh, was not destroyed and still exists. Uh, some coincidence led to uh, an investigation by the UN observers and they pressured the Israelis to allow the people back. The Israelis said, okay, we will let them come back, but actually they didn't. They came back uh, secretly in the night, and a lot of people were caught and sent back. Uh, sent back. Um, Elabun had this unique point, but in the numbers, Elabun is a small massacre. We're talking about 14 people where uh, there, there were massacres much, much worse. Uh, not even there you seen. There, there was another massacre. When I interviewed Elan Pape, he told me about a village. Uh, 1,500 people used to live in the village. The Israelis killed more than 500 of them. Mm. Um, uh, he knows the number because he interviewed the driver of the... Um, uh, um, how, how do you call this machine that digs... Uh, Taxi? Oh, the bulldozer, yeah? Oh. Yeah, bulldozer, exactly. Uh, so he interviewed one of them, and he told him that he, they, they counted the bodies to, to know how, how deep to dig, to dig. And this guy alone counted 250 bodies. Mm, mm, mm. So um, Der Yassin is the most famous massacre. Mm-hmm. Because it was publicized, but there are, were a lot of a lot of them. I was just going to ask. I mean, Day was April 9th, nineteen forty-eight. When was the first massacre in Palestine by um, so-called, you know, Jewish militants or to be Israelis? To be honest, I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's something I found really interesting, um, you know, spending the last couple of years looking at the Israel-Palestine situation and trying to, you know, bring uh, awareness to it, was yeah. that um, the, the, the gulf in sympathy or understanding or the gulf in the image people have of, A, on the one hand, um, the suffering the Palestinians have felt, and B, on the other hand, the suffering that Israelis have felt, you know, almost... Um, you don't know where to start in terms of showing people the reality of the Palestinian suffering because people don't really know anything about it. And in a way, as you, you alluded to before, people think that it, in some way it's comparable to what's happened to Israelis when it's absolutely in no way comparable um, because, you know, the number of massacres and et cetera is just incomparable. I mean, numerically, it's just an unbelievable... Um, set up where everyone has, generally speaking, has sympathy for Israelis and for the Palestinians, they get the last, you know, breads on, you know, breadcrumbs on the table of sympathy. When actually, it's the Palestinians that have felt the most massacres and the most acts of terrorism. Yes, yes. Um, just talking about 47, 48. I asked Elon Pape how many Palestinians were killed. So I expected to to hear 1,000, 2,000, but he told me more than 10,000 were killed. So the Palestinians were a nation of a one million people, a very tiny nation. Yeah, when we are talking about 531 villages destroyed, we are talking about 80 percent of the population. So they turned. 80% of the Palestinians to refugees in a very short time. Most of them actually were deported in the end of uh, 48. Most of the actions uh, in the north, in the Galilee, uh, in, in Operation Hiram, they did a very uh, good job. <laughs> and uh, 
this is not counting uh, the, in, the first intifada, the second intifada, and the uh, years between and after. Uh, and people have no idea. I mean, you, you, you talk to people, most of the people think the conflict started in the first intifada. They have no idea. And when they know that I'm a Christian Palestinian, then they are really surprised. How come? Doesn't make sense. So people think it's a religion conflict. Actually, the Israelis made it a religion conflict. It wasn't. Was never. Mm -hmm. It was about the land. It's about. It's still about the land. In fact, it's uh, still about the land. It's still yeah. about the land because Zionism, which was, which started to, which started this whole process, is Zionism is secular. It's not religious. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So and you know, and we've had a couple of. In fact, um, our last guest was Rabia from the village of Iliban. He referred us to you. Um, he's a Christian Palestinian. And, and in fact, I think many in the West don't even realize that there are Christian Palestinians. They don't even realize yeah. this fact. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They don't know. The majority have no idea. I, I, I was even surprised to discover that there are 400,000 Palestinians living in Chile. Wow. And those 400,000 are mainly Christians. If I got wow, it correctly, wow. they were deported by the British. Mm -hmm. So they, even the British started the Israeli job before, before they did themselves. So we are talking about wow. 400,000 Palestinians living in Chile. Mm -hmm. And even I, I am a Palestinian that I am interested in the whole subject, and I read about it. I discovered it uh, recently, in mm -hmm. the last two, three months. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And That's wrong the media. The media is really deviating the truth. Exactly. The media, well, you know, as a black woman, I can relate to that. The media is a very powerful, powerful, powerful tool, you know, and I, that's why I want to keep yes. Palestine. No, I mean, there's the, the quote by Malcolm X, which is roughly, uh, if you're not careful, the media will have you believing that the victim is the aggressor and the aggressor is the victim or, or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I know yeah. how that works. And so, <laughs> oh, too well. <laughs> and so, you know, and this is why I want to keep Palestine today on the air, because this is a media. This is the media. And it's informing people because believe me people don't know they have no idea what's going on regarding a lot of stuff particularly in america you know i think europe is more informed than america um, Kathleen, how, many messages, uh, how many messages do we get a week uh complaints about the show being uh anti-israel or, or anti-semitic because i think that's always a good benchmark of success in awareness building Oh, well, we, we, we do get complaints about the show being anti-Semitic and me being anti-Semitic. And uh, what I always say is, you know, actually, you know, first I want to say that the CEO of this station, Fred Lundgren, is all about free speech. He's all about free speech. He's, I think he's a terrific man, and I'm grateful that he's able to ha allow us to put this show on the air if we pay for our air time. <laughs> but, <laughs> but also I want to say, you know, I don't mind being called anti-Semitic because if I'm anti-Semitic, what does it make people who support Israel, who support ethnic cleansing of people, who f support the forced sterilization of Ethiopian, e Ethiopian Jews, who support... Yeah, um, yeah. One thousand one ton bombs being rained down upon even more hundreds of tons of bombs being rained down on Palestinian children and women, not to mention. Oh, my gosh, I could just go on and on. So I'll, I'll be anti-Semitic. But what does it make you who is supporting ethnic cleansing of a whole group of people? What are you then? I love, yeah. uh, Hisham, I just wanted to ask you, um, in your experience, you know, what, what power does film have as a medium to you know, spread awareness about what's, what's happened in Palestine? Um, actually, if they get screened enough, uh, it's a powerful tool. And the Sons of Elabun is a very emotional film. It doesn't uh, uh, have a one hate word or 
one angry word. The people are telling their story purely human and purely emotional. So uh, nobody can come and complain about the sons of Elabun of being that on this because you can see the people are not telling you we hate the Jews or we want to kill the Jews. They are wishing for peace, actually. The first, the first sentence that is said in the film by, by a woman from Elabun is saying, I hope this land will have peace someday. So um, the people start to think after watching such a film, uh, a film with no blood, with no violence, with no hate. The problem is uh, such films don't get uh, uh, mainstream uh, screening. And uh, usually people coming to the screenings are people that know about the issue. Probably not very well, but they know about it, and they are interested in it. Well, I think that, uh, that for me, makes so clear the, the necessity of having this radio program, because the people that are listening to this are not in any way pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli. They're folk like you and I, ordinary people who want to know the truth. And I think, um, again, that just makes more special uh, our show today and all of the shows that we have done and will do. Oh, I yeah. like hearing I, that, Harry. Actually, actually, the Sons of Philippine will be screened in Tel Aviv this month. Uh, wow. Yeah. It was screened for Jewish audience uh, by uh, teachers and professors that they wanted to show their uh, students. But this is the first time it's a, a kind of a public uh, screening. It will be screened in Holland uh, in, sept in September and in Germany as well. Uh, so, again... This film, economically, um, it's costing me more money than, uh, than uh, profit, much more, actually. And I don't care. I didn't do it for the money. Uh, actually, the, scre the screenings usually cost me money instead of <laughs> bringing me money. You know, uh, Hisham, when I first decided I wanted to make documentary films about four or five years ago, um, I went to a conference about Palestine, and I met there um, a very famous award-winning Israeli photographer. And I was chatting with him after um, the conference. Uh, I was telling him about my life plans and life goals, and he said, you know, you're crazy. You're going to have to marry an heiress in order to achieve these goals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's funny. I, I, yeah, I filmed this son, uh, the, the Sons of Elbow in 2006. Uh, I rushed because I was afraid that the people will die, and I was oh. right. Uh, most of them died, including my father. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, please. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, I rushed to film the film, and um, I edited the short version that is being screened now, uh, and it was not intended to be actually released. It was intended to help me uh, raise fundings to finish the film. So that was two 2006, yeah? We are now 2013, and I'm still working on the longer version. Mm -hmm. So how long, you, how long is this the, version? The short version is 24 minutes. The longer version will be around one hour. And uh, where can people find the website, Hisham, for the, for the film? There is a website. Uh, it's called uh, sonsofelaboon.com. Uh, in, in, and uh, there you can buy the short version as a support for finishing the longer version. And people that want to donate uh, and help me finish the longer version, they can contact me and just uh, I will let them know how to donate. I want to do that, and I hope that our listeners will help too. That would be very nice. Uh, the longer version will have animations that will illustrate <coughs> some of the events that cannot be illustrated with the archive, mater with ar archive material. So I'm working hard. <coughs> I sent uh, Etlin, um some graphics to show her the quality I'm planning to have for the, the graphics. And uh, animation needs a lot of money and a lot of time. So it's taking me forever, and uh, I will never, never stop. Even if it takes me another 10 years to finish it, I will. 
oh, I love your commitment and I love your passion. And to me, this is a heart-wrenching and heartbreaking story. And I'm delighted to give you the opportunity to share it on Palestine today. We only have, what, one more minute. So, ha- Hishim, would you like, has sh- why do I, you know, today is a bad day for me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I appreciate you guys, you know, indulging me so to speak so would you like to give some closing thoughts on as we go go out yes i would like to tell all the uh, christians that believe that jesus will come back only if israel exists they are wrong because jesus spoke about peace and love and not about killing and burning and destroying with one ton bombs oh i love that and, well, wow wow oh he was i'm sorry i interrupted you we have two more minutes you can continue on I, I apologize for interrupting you yeah no problem and for the rest of the americans and europeans uh being passive will not help and to think it's far away from you it's wrong the the world is a village if we don't stop injustice in the world it will come to us it doesn't matter where it will come to us that's the reason we we have to be active sitting in front of the television and being passive will not help we need to tell our governments they are doing wrong otherwise this planet will turn to a burning ball this planet will turn to rubbish rubbish yeah it is turning to rubbish. Poverty. I was in India. I was depressed for one week for seeing poverty. Mm-hmm. So I hope people will wake up and I hope my, the tears of my father will let them understand the Palestinians suffered and they are still suffering. And even after 60 years, a peaceful man is still uh, crying for for losing his childhood and his brother oh that's a beautiful sentiment thank you Hashim for joining us today we're going to take off thank you Harry uh, thank you, um, thank yeah you. today thank I was sort of tongue tied I really thank appreciate you both of you very very much uh, as I said your story is heartbreaking and heart wrenching and thank you for sharing it with us next week we'll be back with Harry fear in Gaza and we'll have another terrific show for everyone so thank you for joining us we'll be back next week thanks No matter your faith or community, this is a crime against humanity. You're on board KCAA's Inland Talk Express. KCAA, Loma Linda, 1050 AM, the station that leaves no listener behind. From the KCAA Weather Center, I'm Chris Earl Phillips. For this afternoon, clear and a low around 57. Tomorrow, sunny and a high of 90. Then tomorrow night, mostly clear with a low around 57. Heading into the work week, we started off on Monday with sunny skies and a high near 89. Monday night, mostly clear, low around 58. On Tuesday, sunny and a high of 87. Tuesday night, mostly clear, low around 58. On Wednesday, sunny and a high of 89. Wednesday night, mostly clear, low of 59. Thursday, sunny and a high of 90. There's your weather forecast for this hour from a station that leaves no listener behind. NBC News Radio, AM 1050, KCAA. This is the KCAA Community Calendar. Are you a veteran looking for a job? Come to the Honor a Hero Hire a Vet Job and Resource Fair on Tuesday, May 7th at the Ontario Convention Center. Apply for hundreds of job openings, receive confidential counseling, and get help in maximizing your VA benefits. For more information, call 951-304-5431. That's 951-304-5431. Come learn about Loma Linda University Children's Hospital in a fun way. Attend the 28th Annual Children's Day presented by Farmer Boys on Wednesday, May the 8th from 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. Children must be accompanied by an adult. For registration information, call 1-800-825-KIDS. And that's your KCAA Community Calendar. Earth. Sky. Nitrogen pollution is giving some meat-eating plants so many nutrients that they don't need to catch as many flies. That's according to a...